We have time for about 15 minutes of uh, questions and discussion. Anybody have a question? Yes, ma'am. You weren't, you weren't looking at me, were you? <laughs> um, what do I think? Um, you know, I don't, to, uh, the, the question was, do we think that um, the folks that fund the treatment, I guess be the insurance companies or whoever ends up funding treatment in this country, um, will fund the best treatments or just the things that kind of work but not necessarily perfectly? Like, should we be getting the best care available? I guess that's a, a larger question in healthcare. Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I've been trying to just find ways to improve our outcomes because our outcomes, in a sense, are so poor generally that we're always leaving over half the people behind in almost any of our most effective treatments. So I think they're pretty cheap treatments. Even our best ones are pretty cheap. So I more get up on my end, you know, when. I was reading something the other day where someone called $157 for stopping smoking, a lot of money. Um, it was prohibitive, and it was like, huh? You know, it was in pregnant women or something. But anyway, so it's like, it gets kind of crazy what healthcare costs outside the addiction world and the mental health world. It's, it's crazy, and then we have these treatments that you can do for well under, you know, $1,000 half the time, and they're, so I don't know the answer to the question, but that's how I feel about it. But someone else that thinks more about Healthcare, like Lisa, might have a, a better answer. So I don't know that the question has to be a comparison of are we paying for clinicians or are we paying for technology. I think it's, yeah, okay. Well, I think that um, I think that one of the issues, and, and we chatted about it earlier. Bob brought it up in the very beginning, is that we don't have enough service capacity. We don't have enough clinicians to offer this, and so these are just really just tools, right, that can enhance reach and, and service capacity. And I think in terms of reimbursement models, what what we've been seeing um, is that for many years before ACA, before the Affordable Care Act, um, there was a lot of discussion at the Center for Medicaid and Medicare around should we activate reimbursement co codes for these self-management tools or for specific apps. So telemedicine was reimbursed in a lot of states, but these other types of tools were not. And that discussion has really gone away now, we've seen, with the Affordable Care Act, because in a lot of these sort of capitated reimbursement models, the idea is you, you spend a fixed number of dollars to take care of someone's health, right? And so if that means investment in these types of technologies, um, that's an upfront cost, but the savings you could realize from that investment could be tremendous if they actually work and make a difference. So a lot of the discussion has shifted to that. So you, you could include a combination of different types of interventions, which surely could include you know, more traditional models as well, but these can sort of enhance that within, this, within these re reimbursement structures we're seeing. Other questions? Over and, okay. So the questions for people on the internet are um, whether the uh, smoking website is available publicly, is it available in community mental health centers, is it available in addiction treatment centers, and I can't remember what the last one was. Um, right now, the we're using it across New Hampshire in a community mental health Medicaid funded project um, that's a s incentive program for health behavior change. So it's available to Medicaid recipients across New Hampshire. Um, 
We're testing it in several other mental health centers in this randomized controlled trial. I'm really interested in piloting it in clinics that want to try it. So, you know, if you know of a clinic that's interested, let me know. I'm really wanting to think about models for how can clinics use these kinds of tools, integrate it into their workflow, benefit from it. Um, I think we just have a lot to learn about that right now. We, we don't know a whole lot about that yet. So come find me if, if you know of somebody who wants to try it. Go I ahead. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I, one of the um, priorities, I think, in, in this state and probably across the country is integration of treatment services with primary care. So I'm wondering if each of you can think about ways that your technologies could be integrated into general health care systems to help people with um, substance use disorders. Um, I, saw, I, I saw Tracy that yours would be really excellent if screening were done and somebody who's identified with high risk alcohol use, that perhaps then they could ask a counselor to do a motivational call. That was one thing that came up, but I was wanted to think about the other technologies and how can they help expand capacity through general healthcare systems? A program like mine is pretty straightforward. The, um, the quote support staff in a primary care office, a nice nurse or whatever else you call the folks that are working. They're your therapist, in a sense, in the program that we've developed. So right now, it's my research assistant, who has no experience in this. He's just a nice guy that's helping you and answering your questions for you, and sets you up on your computer, and collects your urine sample, and gets your incentives going. And so it's, you know, it, it's ideal for those kind of settings. And then if you need specialty care, you can access the therapist in specialty care as an add-on, rather than as the starting it from that angle and going, the other direction. That's kind of how I is it actually available now? No. Uh, well, no. Mine isn't. Mine isn't necessarily available. The TES system is getting close to production. I think. I don't at least my now. How close? I, but is people, can people access yeah. it from the public? Yeah. Oh yes, yeah, so, and it's a pretty similar kind of thing. I'm. I'm thinking the the program that I showed you is really designed to be used um, in connection with an expert clinician who, in, in the case of the programs I'm developing, would be a tobacco specialist, either in a mental health clinic, a primary care clinic, or an addiction clinic. Um, the program can do the work of the evidence-based treatment, um, but what we found when we've implemented tools like this is that people still want you, the clinician, they really still want to touch base with a human being to help them navigate their path to recovery. They really like using technology-based tools, but in no way do most people, they still want the human being as well. So I see the, these in the future working in conjunction with treatment experts. I've tried to design my tool so that it can be facilitated by a non-expert who can at least know how to access the web and deal with uh, streaming problems like I just had. Um, but also in conjunction with a tobacco expert who is gonna answer questions and help steer people where they need to go in the program and process it with them. Especially for people with cognitive impairments or disadvantaged populations, I think that's gonna be needed. Mm -hmm. um, there may be a subgroup of people who can really do self-guided treatment or completely self-directed treatment and access this kind of thing on the web and completely do a recovery path on their own. I believe there's probably a large group of people who can do that. But there's also a large group of people, who, I think, who are we're going to want to use technology tools in conjunction with a clinician. And those are probably the people who are already in the treatment system. But all, we always have to keep in mind the great majority of people are not in the treatment system and probably don't want to be. Uh, it seems like to me one of the um, consequences of the technology revolution is that it's going to uh, move things increasingly in the direction of people taking control of their own health care. And I believe these tools will be, uh, you know, sold outside of the health system and there will be more and more uh, people who feel like they want to direct their own health care. Uh, one question I have for all of you is, you know, 
every longitudinal study following people for 10, 20 years or more of recovery shows that lots of the people in recovery uh, have never gotten treatment but have had lots of involvement with AA and NA. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, which are wonderful resources in so many ways, I'm wondering how the technology tools have been developed and used in order to enhance uh, people's connection with um, various self-help and peer support uh, strategies. So, Bob, Bob, before we jump to that, I just okay. wanted to add one additional follow-up point to sure. Seddon's question. I think it's a really important topic that we should be discussing around how to you know, integrate addiction treatment, screening and, and interventions for addiction into primary care. And I think we're seeing growing demand for that in part because of ACA and sort of integrated models. Um, we have one um, national study we're doing now where we're embedding a, a technology-based system for addiction treatment into federally qualified health centers, and it's a multi-state sort of implementation. And the heavy focus is not just on patient outcomes, but on all the organizational factors that are important to consider, right? Not does it work with patients, which is an important question, but what impacts adoption? How does it fit into workflow? How does it fit into um, sort of reimbursement models? And, and how is it perceived by all the relevant stakeholders, right? Not just the payers, but the administrators, the clinicians, the patients, the systems in which they exist, et cetera. So there's a lot of research opportunity around that. And you asked specifically about New Hampshire. And we're very hopeful. We're in hopefully the final stages of planning a, a similar kind of project in New Hampshire and Vermont. and. Um, and Sarah Lord will be talking later this afternoon about implementation research in this space and how do you, you know, how do you promote adoption, sustained use, and bring value to systems and all the relevant stakeholders when you implement these types of tools. And so this project, if it launches, would start with a pretty um, involved sort of formative development phase of really understanding what are the barriers and facilitators to adoption in primary care, what would be the best models of adoption, um, and then to, based on that experience, actually do some demonstration projects um, in New Hampshire and or Vermont. So um, if folks here are in treatment systems in Vermont or New Hampshire and you have some interest in being part of that, please give us your contact info because we hope to launch this in the next month or so. It would be terrific to have you involved. Yeah. That's great. Why don't you also um, say something about how these tools might be used in conjunction with peer support, which we know is an important part of recovery. Anyone? I think they're, these tools are ideal to be used in peer support in a setting where, you know, there's peers around who know what you're going through and can help you use the program and talk it through and process it. Um, I, I think it's it's really, you know, technology-based tools are ideal to, to work in that setting. So, however, I'm not aware of any demonstration projects or actual studies where technology has been implemented in peer support. Sarah, do you know, can you comment on that at all? Yeah. There, there is a lot of AA and AA and a chat lines. You can do it online for quite a while now. Um, mm -hmm. You go online, you can get into a group and do your thing. Um, Lisa, I remember we went at that, at that conference where people talked a lot about developing social media, Facebook kind of organ yeah. trials, and I thought a few of them were. Um, well, first of all, just to, I, I, it's interesting, th th this question, because what we've seen in a lot of our projects with lots of different populations is that people want that. People want this, they, they, they value sort of personalized tools that can be relevant to their experience, but they also want some connection with a group like them, right? So we've seen this with, you know, aging, chronic pain patients, we've seen it with vets, with trauma and substance use, we've seen it with children, we see it with lots of populations. Um, there is some... Uh, growing work that um, suggests that this could be really useful. One example that comes to mind is a colleague of ours, Dave Gustafson, who some of you probably know at the University of Wisconsin-Madison has a mobile recovery support tool called HS. And it has a lot of features on it. It includes a lot of sensing. It includes um, a lot of uh, input that uh, individuals um, put in about their cravings and sort of um, and um, when they're feeling at risk, they can sort of access in the moment interventions. It has features like the GPS in the phone will um, 
triggers so will notify someone when they're nearing a location where they used to use substances at a high risk location for them and help, um, help them strategize about how they won't uh, be at risk for relapse in that context. But one of the features it has is the social support piece. So it, it connects you to a network of other people in recovery from substance use. And as I've understood it, he hasn't isolated that piece in terms of evaluating it, but um, he's gotten a lot of uh, uh, positive response from the users of that tool that that's a piece of it they really value. Great. Kathy? Yeah, I just wanted to travel back to what Lisa was saying about screening and brief intervention, expert type of initiatives. Um, our, at the addiction treatment program at Dartmouth, we're working now in conjunction with OB to roll out um, very small pilot uh, of expert in the OB clinics and um, are really interested. It's great to hear that Sarah may be presenting something to that effect, really interested in any kind of technological help. Um, in terms of we kind of built out our treatment aspect first, a, a perinatal addiction treatment program. So we built the T first and now we're kind of working backwards to implement the screening and brief intervention in the OB clinics. And just with ESPERT um, as part of the Affordable Health Care Act, I imagine that, that there's going to be, you know, as treatment providers, we want to be working on the continuum and we want to get out of our traditional treatment models and really see that screening. And, brief intervention going on in, in medical arenas and, and be a part of that initiative. Um, and just curious what we can be expecting if there's any um, brief intervention technologies. Um, I'm a person that trains folks, but it would really be a lot more effective to have some computerized brief intervention models and, and things like that. So, Didn't know if anyone wanted to comment on that. <clears throat> So I would strongly encourage you to talk to Sarah Lord. I think she may have just stepped out for a minute. Um, so she's done a lot of screening and brief intervention work with um, substance use in lots of different settings, mostly with young adults. But there, um, there's some really uh, uh, a grow a growing. It's a growing area of research. Um, there's some interesting work that has come out of Steve Onder's Ma's lab. We can connect you with him if that's of interest. He's done some really interesting work with postpartum and pregnant women, and really trying to use that approach to help those women who are pregnant or just recently delivered who are involved in substance use um, to uh, increase motivation to change that use. Um, uh, there's some work out of the VA at NYU with vets around this. There's, there's examples of it, but Sarah Lord uh, has done a lot of work in that, and she probably would be a great resource to you. Great. Andrew, I think that the work you're doing is really critical because the availability of sensors and of uh, phones with multiple capacities is going to streak way ahead of the slow uh, scientific health care delivery process. I hope you're thinking about how these things might translate into helping people who have behavioral problems to modify their behavior. Could you tell us uh, what's in the offing? Well, first of all, it's uh, great to be on this panel. I think I'm above my pay grade or below it being here. <laughs> um, so, you know, what, what, what uh, interests me is, um, you know, how can we, you know, you brought this up, Bob, you know, people who don't step into the healthcare system, how can we develop, you know, technologies that may help them, yeah. whatever their situation is. Um, so, you know, I've, I've um, I'm been fortunate enough to work in a project with uh, Draw Ben Z who couldn't be here today. I think Rachel's going to chat about the project in the afternoon, so I won't steal her thunder. But we're working with um, a group of uh, schizophrenic patients down at Long Island Hospital um, with the idea of actually taking this um, background technology on sensing that can automatically um, compute things like the things I discussed this morning, s sleep duration, um, looking at sociability, looking at activity and try to build models that can be find trigger points in relapse and, and, the, and therefore the, then engage in intervention. So I'm really excited about this uh, new Eureka project that uh, Draw um, put together that we're working on over the next uh, couple of years with um, 100 and I think it's 150 people um, down at that hospital. So for me that's exciting because I'm very much interested in what Lisa brought up which is we can develop these um, technologies that can, um, in an automated way, infer our behavior, but we all walk differently. We all talk differently. And so therefore, it's really important that these algorithms, computer scientists like myself and others are developing, 
can be personalized. Somehow, you know, we put an application on the phone and it tunes itself to your specific environment, your context. And I think when we can do that, and there are many hard problems there, then we can, then we can think about developing really um, well-tuned, automated interventions that could help somebody who's out in the community and not necessarily engaged in the healthcare system. I think that concept could radically change the way that people, that people get help. Great, yeah. thank you. Other questions, or, and do we have a little more time? Yes. Okay, yeah. great. Seven more. Other questions? Yeah, Don. I don't have a question, but oh. I think the uh, recovery community is really uh, out there and doing a lot of things with folks that are maybe not in academia, but some of them are, and some of them are in books. And there are these conferences. There's one that's happening now where 20,000 people are involved. It's going on for a whole week. You know, the, the, the people that they present, questions are asked, and then people respond to that. And that seems like, you know, it seems within the recovery community. And that's happening at this very moment. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it got, it's the second wave of a week-long thing, because based on the first week, they, you know, months later, they said, whoa, we could get people's response to it. It was just like all automatic, you know. They, they made themselves, uh, they created them themselves and then put it out and then what was really responsive, then they repeated it. And now more people, it's like 20,000 people around the world. Online? Yeah, online. Mm -hmm. But you can see it online. You can hear and talk to. So somehow they created, you know, this whole network that just is grown up. Yeah, I think these on, um, what Don Wade has been talking about are all the online, uh, networks that have been created for peer support and education and help among people um, who have specific kinds of problems. And I, I, it does seem like to me that movement and the technology movement and the uh, movement uh, for people to take control of their own health care uh, is going to change dramatically what, what happens in the health care sphere and that that those of us in healthcare need to be thinking about how to connect with and help all of those uh, systems to work rather than continue our narrow, narrow path of thinking about, okay, how can we improve the care for the 5% of people who come in and get evidence-based care? You know, it's the 95% who have no access to evidence-based care that we should be worried about. And, Hopefully that the NIH would worry about too, uh, although we're far from that. Yes, ma'am. I would just say in that light, I think it would be wise for the people who are developing these things to touch base with faces and voices of recovery at the national level. Yeah. Great. Could everyone hear that? Yeah, okay. Um, any thoughts from our panelists about, uh, any further thoughts about how we connect with this huge uh, recovery community and with, um, uh, you know, part of that really made, made me think about Lynn's uh, presentation. And, you know, we know a lot about which kids and which adolescents are vulnerable. And uh, we do a very poor job of uh, providing targeted uh, prevention interventions uh, for those people. And, you know, as the DNA and other tests uh, evolve, you know, we're, we're going to know way ahead of time people that are very, very vulnerable for these uh, illnesses. Any thoughts about what should we be doing on either front? Uh, the recovery community or the pre-recovery community that's so vulnerable with technology? Okay. Games. <laughs> I, 
I think you connected that with Lynn a lot in her presentation on games, and that seems yeah. like such a low-hanging fruit. Yeah. Why are our games just fun? You can build merit and growth into games pretty easily. So I think that's an exciting opportunity. Good. I think the other thing is is that there's there are opportunities where people are just you know, and I think this is the one of the sort of powers of, of devices, especially mobile devices and technology, is that people are on them constantly, right? I mean, I, I'm, it's, it's actually really sort of a distressing, but you'll look around a restaurant and like literally everybody is on something, right? So it feels like, you know, instead of, and you know, a lot of the work I've done in addiction treatment and a lot of, you know, sort of all those conversations is that, you know, this has, this has to be a discussion that, that's ongoing all the time during every part of life. It can't just sort of be when you come in and see your, you know, your treatment provider or, you know, you're in a group or you're in a meeting. I mean, it really has to like infiltrate every aspect of your life. So I think the point you're making about, you know, kids and I think in terms of the recovery community, I mean, it, it, it kind of has to just be there ever, ever present all the time, you know, so that with kids, you know, let them play while they're sitting to wait, you know, waiting to meet with a pediatrician, right? We all know pediatricians can make you wait a long time. Kids can be playing games that can, like, accomplish something. You know, in recovery, I mean, it doesn't have to be at that, you know, that discussion in the treatment center. It can be happening all the time, like 24-7. And I think it actually could be in a very effective way of sort of continuing that discussion you know, not in substitution of a, of a therapist or a treatment provider, but in addition and more, you know, you know, more ongoing, so.